Section 1.4, the pages ahead. In it, this section provides an overview of the remaining chapters throughout the book, chapters th 2 through 14. So let's take a look at these in brief, and you can read a little bit more detail in, in your online text. So chapter 2, strategy and technology, concepts and frameworks for understanding what separates winners from losers. The basic idea in this chapter is there's a very strong relationship between technology and your business strategy. We're going to introduce you to some ideas uh, largely put forward by a Harvard Business School uh, strategic scholar named Michael Porter. We're going to look at how to a framework for evaluating the structure and profitability of an industry, of describing the various activities that your business engages in to add value to your customers, uh, we're going to look at different ways that uh, technology can interplay there uh, and provide a, what we call a sustainable competitive advantage. There's various ways of competing in the marketplace and technology has a role in supporting uh, any of these strategies. So that, that's kind of the focus of chapter two. Chapter three is something of a mini case study on a company called Zara. You may be familiar with Zara. They're a fast fashion company and they have used technology in a very conservative yet very powerful approach. So Zada doesn't believe in investing in technology just because it's shiny and cool, but they found ways of using it particularly in their operations and uh, in their uh, sales and marketing activities to create a very efficient and data-driven organization that has led its uh, CEO, Armancio uh, Ortega, I believe is his name, to become one of the richest men in the world. Okay, So Zara has made a name for itself in the fast fashion industry because of its data-driven, very strategic investments in information technology. Chapter 4, another case study, Netflix and 2 acts. We're going to look at how Netflix used information technology to become one of the successful and surviving members of the initial dot-com era and uh, have made their way into profitability and have become what we call an e-commerce or electronic commerce or electronic business giant. We're also going to look at the challenges and opportunities that Netflix faces as it moves into another period of its life cycle, of its business history, and that is they're in process of moving from a DVD-focused business model of shipping out the physical DVDs to one of digital distribution. We're, we're moving the business from from sending out atoms, sending out hard tangible things like discs to sending out bits. There's two very different approaches to doing business and, and there's some opportunities as well as challenges that we need to look at as we consider that many businesses in the next few decades are going to have to undergo a similar transition. In chapter 5, Moore's Law. Moore's Law, as I mentioned in a previous video, is this trend that the cost of computing is decreasing dramatically, while the performance capabilities of computers are increasing dramatically. So we're getting faster, cheaper computing. This has lots of implications, lots of consequences for businesses. It's enabled the rise of companies like Apple and Amazon. It allows you to have mobile phones in your pockets that are more powerful than the supercomputers were just one or two decades ago. Okay, So there's a lot of growth here. Okay, There's a lot of opportunity. There are some limitations to see what there's an open question whether this trend is going to be able to continue. There are limits to this trend we're going to learn about. We're going to learn about making lots of computers work together, about supercomputers, about grid computers, about tying things across the internet. All of that falls in here. And lastly, we're going to look at well, what happens when this, the last generation of computing gets too old. We throw it away. What does it mean environmentally? What does it mean for the business? What does it mean for your inventory when we've got this, this downward pressure on the cost and the, the lifetime of computing products. Okay. Chapter 6 leads us into something called network effects. This is a phenomenon that is very popular, very 
frequently uh, frequently occurs in technology related businesses and business activities the idea with network effects is the more users the more people use a product the more valuable it becomes okay one example of this is if you were to go on Facebook and there's only five people on Facebook right how valuable is Facebook to you if there's only five people on Facebook maybe you're friends with all five of those but the odds are maybe one of those five is your friend so there's limited value now if there's a billion people on Facebook the odds are quite a few of your friends are probably on Facebook so the value of Facebook to you grows dramatically in relationship to the number of people using the service and we see this not just in social networks we see this in various forms of software this is why Microsoft Office is still very popular today we see this in identifying companies like Amazon that become these e-commerce giants why does everybody go to eBay for their auctioning why do people put up their ads on Craigslist okay. all of these tie back to network effects why is the iPhone so popular why is Android so popular and yet maybe Windows is gaining in popularity maybe what what do they have to do to be able to compete in this space when there's these network effects so that's that's chapter six chapter seven looks at something called social media which includes not just social networks but it also includes other types of systems that enable um, the publication and the commenting and sharing of uh, digital content Okay, so blogs, uh, microblogs like Twitter, uh, wiki software like Wikipedia, okay, online social networks, Facebook, LinkedIn, Google+, what happened to MySpace. We're going to talk about things like that and understanding that there's a business model here and that the web has transitioned from a medium, a communications channel that was largely, you know, when I was coming out of high school, it was largely static. They were just web pages that you clicked on and you read. Now the web is dynamic. We sign in, we contribute, we upload, we link to, we post, we do all of this stuff and we call this web version 2.0. Okay, so there's business opportunities here. There are business challenges here. We're going to offer you some guidance. Chapter 8 looks at Facebook, building a business from a social graph. It's a case study of Facebook as they go from startup into IPO and looking beyond. Okay, how does Facebook make money? What is their core competitive advantage? What, how do network effects come into play? Okay, what data assets do they have? What makes it so that people don't want to leave Facebook necessarily for another competing social networking platform? What's the value of Facebook? Facebook had kind of a bumpy ride when they went public with their stock. Why is that? Okay, what's in Facebook's future? What about the transition to mobile devices and how we use those and how is that impacting or opening the way? What's coming next? Okay, we're going to explore those themes and more in Chapter 8. Chapter 9, Understanding Software, a Primer for Managers. So computer hardware is the physical things like mice, keyboards, laptops, monitors. That's hardware. That's the physical stuff. The software is what runs. It's your apps. It's the instructions. It's the operating system. Okay, So we're going to give you an overview of software, what software is, how it works, different types of software. You may get an opportunity to practice creating your own software. Then also of using something called enterprise software, software that runs across multiple functions within a business. So that's understanding software, a primer for managers. In chapter 10, you're going to look at software in flux. Software is changing. Okay. We're seeing the rise of things like open source software. So companies may pay their employees to contribute to software products that are then given away for free. Now, why do they do this? One of the reasons they do this is because then they get nice, good software that's free. And then other companies that are also contributing, they get to share in this mutual benefit, this software that everybody worked on together. So but how do you make any money creating software that nobody pays for? Okay, so we're going to look at that. We're going to look at another trend in software called cloud computing, or software as a service. Okay, the idea is software is something that's delivered over the web. And this could be office productivity suites. Okay, we're now starting to see Microsoft is going into something called Office 365 we can allow people to subscribe to software instead of selling them a DVD that they download. Okay, there's pros and cons to this. Okay, We're also seeing other types of 
services delivered. We're, we're starting to see video games delivered as a service over the web, movies delivered as a service over the web, lots of stuff being delivered. It's all software. Software is eating up lots of industries. And whether it's being delivered through your web browser or through an application on your, your mobile device, software is changing. Sometimes it's free. Oftentimes it's running off computers in the cloud or over the internet on somebody else's computer. So we're going to look at those and some of the decisions you need to make whether you should purchase technology. Basically it's a rent, lease versus buy decision and there's some factors in there. Chapter 11, the data asset, databases, business intelligence and competitive advantage. You want to find something in your business that's hard to copy, that's valuable, that's that's difficult to find a substitute for, and that's, um, and that's rare data often fits these criteria. If you can get and collect data about your business and about your customers, about your products, and about the industry that you're competing in, this can help you make better decisions. Okay, the challenge we're facing today is the volume of data is growing tremendously. The speed at which data is being added to our systems is growing tremendously. You have these multinational corporations that are that are logging billions of transactions per month. So how do you do this? How do you keep track of all of this data? How do you make your data something of value to you? And we're gonna look in the chapter at diff the ways different companies have innovated using their data asset. Okay, chapter 12, A Manager's Guide to the Internet and Telecommunications provides you with an overview of how do, how do we connect all these computers together? How does the internet work? Why do you really need to care as a manager? What types of decisions do you need to make um, so that you can understand how we get people connected? Okay? And what business opportunities will be coming down the future as we bring the next billion users onto the internet. So that's chapter 12, A Manager's Guide to the Internet and Telecommunications. Chapter 13, Information security, barbarians at the gate, and just about everywhere else. The idea here is that now that so many of our resources are digital, our, our customer records are digital, our business processes are digital, our operations are digital, our distribution channels are increasingly digital, we're transitioning, like I said, from atoms to bits. Our money is digital. So what does that mean to criminals? That means your money's digital. That means I can come and utilize your resources. That means I can come and hack into your systems. I can steal your customers' data. I can grab your credit card transactions. Any given week of the year, you can go online and find very shocking stories about data breaches, about cyber attacks between companies, between nations, between individuals of varying levels of sophistication. You need to be aware of this because it's going to be an increasing area of concern for managers. And if you're interested in pursuing technology as a career, information security is a very, very strong growth, uh, has a very, very strong job growth outlook for the foreseeable future, okay? So lastly, we're going to come into uh, chapter 14, Google in three parts. We're going to look at Google in terms of their search engine offering. There's, um, we're going to look at online advertising, and then we're going to look at beyond. What's Google going into next? They have a lot of projects uh, available. So this is something of a case study as well, but should introduce you to some of these broader issues of search, online advertising, and what's next. Okay, we'll leave that as an open question. So these are... Uh, this is the overview of the textbook. Hopefully something in here is sparking your interest. You can go ahead and read ahead. Um, you can explore things, look at them deeply. Uh, I want you to consider maybe what interests you most. Maybe what scares you most. You're going, I have no idea what he's talking about there. We're going to walk through these topics. We're going to give you the opportunity to explore them in more depth throughout the rest of the course. And that's it.